Welcome to another episode of the AABIP podcast. During the episodes, we discuss unique and often controversial topics in interventional pulmonology. The topics discussed often do not have a high quality evidence base, and we seek the opin- opinion of our invited experts to learn their approach to a specific clinical scenario. The views expressed on this episode are not necessarily those endorsed by the AABIP. For today's podcast, we're going to discuss bronchoscopic management of endobronchial carcinoids. And our expert for today is Dr. Ashutosh Sachdeva. Dr. Sachdeva is the Director of Interventional Pulmonology and also the Program Director of the Fellowship of Interventional Pulmonology at the University of Maryland. Ash, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, That It is my pleasure. And I want to thank uh, both you and the organizers, as well as AABIP, for hosting me. Thank you. And before we get started, do you have any conflicts of interest to disclose that would be relevant to this talk? No, I do not have any conflicts of interest relative to this talk. All right, let's dive into the topic then. Endobronchial carcinoids, the gold standard of management is surgical, we all would agree. However, bronchoscopic management does play a role. So Ash, when do we consider a bronchoscopic management? What type of patients are we looking at here? That's a great question, Udit. I, I would agree that surgical resection, parenchymal sparing, when feasible, is the gold standard. And I think we encounter a few situations where we may have to sacrifice more lung, such as patients may have to undergo pneumonectomy, or the location of the carcinoid uh, uh, is challenging. You may be able to achieve endo bronchial resection as well as treatment in one setting. Um, <clears throat> but in general, I think the idea is that you can save somebody from a bigger surgery compared to a parenchymal sparing surgery. Okay. And then, uh, but what are the specific scenarios? Like, do you have a particular tumor size that you look at? What are you looking at on the CAT scan? Which patient do I pick for endobronchial resection? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, Certainly, CT scan is quite meaningful. As you know, many of these patients will present with post-obstructive phenomenon, either a pneumonitis or pneumonia, or uh, occasionally hemoptysis, but they have some type of post-obstructive phenomenon. So in that context, sometimes size can be difficult to judge because there is inflammation, inflammation, also, I would uh, say that there is um, lymphadenopathy that may be unrelated to the carcinoid, mm-hmm. and you have to be carefully uh, assessing the scans. Um, in general, if the tumor size is less than two centimeters, and we are talking about the airway tumors, correct, not the, um, the distal one, um, <clears throat> and if their stock or the, the base of the tumor, which is hard to judge on a CT scan, is uh, somewhere less than... 1.5 centimeters square. Um, I'll, I'll say maybe if the base is five millimeter and you uh, kind of multiply the uh, other dimension, that, that mm-hmm. will give you about 2.5 centimeters square, but somewhere in that range, it would be feasible. Um, I would be careful in making a assumption on the size because it can be difficult to quantify when you are doing a bronchoscopy. Um, on the imaging characteristics, we don't capture tumor volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, that could be one factor. And then if the patients do not have clinical N2, th- I think those are the patients uh, who would be best fit to get endoscopic resection. And, and let me rephrase it, um, clinical N2 or clinical N1, and then we confirm that lymph node is not involved and we can offer endoscopic resection. An important factor, I don't want to misses the airway wall invasion beyond the thickness of the airway wall. If there is any concern, that would be um, certainly needs to be evaluated by all possible invasive means as well as um, additional scanning if possible. So uh, on a CT scan, sometimes it's very challenging to see whether the carcinoid has invaded the airway wall. How Do you use radial EPAS or do you just look at the CAT scan? So I've started using radial balloon EBUS to better assess the airway involvement. Mm 
I would admit that it is not a very sensitive tool. But if you are seeing some degree of loss of airway uh, integrity, basically the wares of the the airway wall, then you you could potentially be concerned, and that uh, needs to be further evaluated. Correct. So because to evaluate the base, you've already gone through your procedure, right? You've already resected the tumor. Now you're assessing the base. So it probably would just change your approach in terms of follow-up and more frequent surveillance or something like that, right? It, it, it may. Uh, one of the things I'm always careful is, and as we talk further along about the management, um, it, is how, how best to evaluate at the time of initial resection. When you start resecting the tumor, uh, whatever modality you use, there is some degree of injury that we are creating, whether I use heat modality or cold energy. And in that context, sometimes it's very hard to make that assessment at the first sitting. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is post-obstructive changes, there is active inflammation, and many times the secretions haven't been suctioned. The patients may be on antibiotics, but they haven't yet recovered completely from this inflammatory process that sets in as a secondary insult. So if mm-hmm. I have to summarize what you're saying, parenchymal sparing surgery is the treatment of choice. However, if a parenchymal sparing surgery is not possible or surgery is not possible altogether, bronchoscopic assessment should be considered, especially in those people or only in those people who do not have lymph node spread and especially in those who have a small tumor, less than two centimeters in size, with a small base, however you define that. Would that be correct? That would be correct, yeah. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so you alluded, you, you were alluding to this. Uh, so we decide to bronchoscopically resect the carcinoid. How do you do that? What do you use? Do you like heat, cold? What's your modality of choice? <laughs> uh, I laugh because um, I have evolved in my choices uh, also, I want to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think the location of the tumor has something to help me decide as well. If I'm able to put a snare across the base and I can snare the first portion or get maximal uh, tumor out, I, I like to do that. There are certain advantages of that. But if that seems to be not feasible, or I'm going to be encountering a phenomenon where I have to do an onion rearing, then I, I would prefer to have a cryoprobe addition and debulking as well. Um, but either choice I start with, I prefer to do a cryo debulking for the base to achieve maximal resection and then do additional cryotherapy uh, around the base and five millimeter, um, you know, uh, what I call the <clears throat> penumbra zone and try to make sure that we, we, we got rid of most of the tumor cells that may be spreading outside in the bronchial epithelium. So if you can snare a carcinoid, you prefer that option probably because it's quicker, there would be less bleeding because you cauterize the base. However, if uh, snaring is not possible, you will cryo debulk a lesion and you would also treat the base with delayed effect cryotherapy with overlapping zones. Is that correct to say? Correct. Have you tried cryo spray at the base? I have not. For um, The only reason I have not is because most of the tumor that I've resected are in either middle robe or the lower robe zones or upper robe. And I'm more careful and cautious about uh, using the current forms of spray cryotherapy distal, for distal disease. What about heat at the base, like uh, APC? I think that's a very reasonable approach. Um, the reason I've kind of shied away from APC is that it, it, we have already created some degree of injury with electrocautery snare, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Um, I tend to have a better view of the base because the cryotherapy does not distort the, um, the, the mucosa immediately. And I can still, still achieve 
a zone, overwrapping zone, as you defined. Um, and I think I, I have tended to have that as a preferred modality for the base. Okay. Cryotherapy, if you're using to debulk, obviously could be associated with bleeding. And we traditionally are taught that carcinoid tumors bleed. Do they bleed? <laughs> um, so I'm going to give the answer in two parts. I think if you're sampling with a bronchoscopic biopsy, whether you use a needle sampling or a mechanical biopsy, I think there's a good bit of literature uh, suggesting that the bleeding is risk is no higher than any other tumor. So I think it's probably uh, less than 1% or close to that range. Mm-hmm. Um, our center actually published, and my partners did, they looked at uh, all carcinoid over the past 10 years at University of Maryland, and the risk of bleeding was no higher. None of the patients required any urgent intervention from IR or uh, surgical intervention. And be mindful, these were done prior to my time in the sense that these were done under moderate sedation. Not all patients got anesthesia, and it was pretty safe in terms of biopsy. Um, Coming to the second part, tumor debulking, right? That gets a little um, more intense in the terms of you're going to do cryoadhesion and kind of essentially uh, depart or separate the tumor from its uh, native feeder vessels. Mm -hmm. So there you have to be real careful. Um, In general, the, the tumor per se doesn't bleed as much. That is not manageable. But as you get closer to the base, you have to be careful because there could be a bronchial artery feeder. One of the things that has helped me is if I'm able to pass a linear EBUS scope, uh, across the obstruction or as I've debulked some of the tumor, I tend to use that and see if I can capture those bronchial vessels. If I can, I prefer to then um, cauterize or use some, some type of heat energy to actually um, uh, roast the tumor, if I may say, and then carefully um, do the cryo debulking. I'm prepared to have a balloon and, of course, uh, these patients are under rigid bronchoscopy, and I make sure that they do not have any other compromise, such as uh, systemic inflammatory response from pneumonia that has been treated, um, and they can be oxygenated and ventilated without difficulty. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, thank you. And uh, so you dissect your patient's carcinoid. How do you follow them up? Now, we know the ACCP gives a grade 2C recommendation based on very small retrospective data to first do a surveillance bronchoscopy at six weeks and then six monthly for two years and annually thereafter without a specified endpoint. So how do you, how do you go about your uh, surveillance? Yeah, um, it's a little bit tough to have defined endpoints at time. However, I would say that I am biased to actually follow up these patients in about six weeks, Mm -hmm. Um, principally to make sure that if I've used heat energy in small segment, let's say a middle lobe segment or a superior segment branch point, then I want to make sure there's no uh, scar formation. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, they will get a scar band, which I can release, and then that does not lead to potentially not lead to a future atelectasis or... um, um, uh, attrition of that segment. So that's one. Two, it gives me a better mucosal picture because the inflammation has gone away. Also, I can now reassess the lymph nodes and see if they have regressed. If they haven't, I would sample the lymph nodes as well at that time okay. to do a full mediastinal staging. Mm-hmm. Um, it is unclear whether you should do it at the first bronchoscopy. And if you have negative sample, what do you make out of it? Mm-hmm. My concern with that is that there could be a tumor spillage, first of all. And the second is the lymph nodes are, in general, very reactive. So when you uh, stick a needle, you get a bloody sample. Did you get adequate sampling? Did you just dilute the, blo- uh, the sample with uh, because the lymph nodes were reactive? All those things come to my mind. So I like to do that on the second sitting. 
Mm-hmm. The third thing is you can actually do a better balloon radial EBUS evaluation at that time because all that, as I just said, information has settled down and you have a better view and uh, you can better assess the airway wall structure. Got it. So, does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Um, one final question then. Uh, how do you weigh in histology? So let's say typical versus atypical carcinoid. Now, of course, your threshold to stage the mediastinum will be much lower with an atypical carcinoid. But do you even consider an atypical carcinoid for bronchoscopic management? Or would you be a little more aggressive with surgery in these patients? Um, well, if, my, if I may want to go back on your prior question, actually, I think I answered the short-term follow-up, but I didn't answer the long-term follow-up of these patients. Um, when I started doing uh, carcinoid, I was very regimented in bringing the patients six months and then additional six months. And I tend to become a little more relaxed because on my second bronchoscopy, if I've done a, a, a good cryotherapy session and there was no um, endoluminal component and my repeat biopsies were negative and the patient's um, lymph nodes were negative, and they were doing well, I may want to push uh, the next bronchoscopy to six months and then the subsequent to nine months and then um, once a year. Uh, Again, the question is how long of a time do you do bronchoscopic surveillance versus when do you just say I will do CT surveillance? And that gets tricky. As you know, the bronchoscopic surveillance uh, most people will say, let's go up to five years because there still could be a tumor reoccurrence of as high as 4%. Um, and, and then there is a thought process because of old literature that maybe we should do up to 10 years because that's uh, some some carcinoids will reoccur and we have not done the standard of care. Um, it's all the case reports that we follow. So I, I want the audience to be mindful of that and kind of discuss that with the patients and work with the patients to decide on the timeline. Mm-hmm. So I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, coming to your the last question that you asked about typical, car, uh, sorry, atypical carcinoids, um, when do you do that? And I think the, the answer typically comes from a multidisciplinary team discussion meetings where the patient cannot undergo surgery because of comorbidities, or um, we are doing it for palliation, or that patient does not want a a pneumonectomy or a robectomy at that time and uh, is comfortable with surveillance. We do not recommend that because the risk of um, lymph node metastasis or recurrence is pretty high. Again, there is good literature supporting that if you have just N1 disease with typical carcinoid, um, you're still better off with surgery, um, if that if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. All right. This has been extremely insightful for me. I'm sure our audience is going to learn a lot as well. Uh, any closing comments, Ash? No, I think um, um, this is an area that where we should have a multi-center either a registry or a clinical uh, follow-up on these patients um, and possibly a standardized approach to uh, to offer endobronchial treatment. Um, at least from my personal experience, I've been following uh, about seven patients over the past eight to nine years, and there has not been a reoccurrence based on a, a methodical strategy. Of course, all of our patients go through a multidisciplinary team discussion meetings, and um, th- that, has been a, uh, that has been very helpful in decision-making. Absolutely. Uh, this is uh, one of those many areas in IP that I think could do with more data, even if retrospective. But your comments have been fantastic, and uh, thank you so much for your insightful comments. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank Take you care. Again. Thank you.